Thank you all. As you've uh, witnessed here today, it'll be about 40, 45 minutes of discussion with our panelists, and then we'll open in the last 10 to 15 minutes to questions uh, with the audience. So as uh, Evan mentioned, we're fo focusing on social infrastructure related to the oil boom, primarily healthcare and education. I'll start first by introducing my uh, distinguished panelists here. Seated next to me is State Representative Jose Menendez, a San Antonio native. He served on the city council here, first elected to State House District 124 in 2000, and is seeking re-election for his seat. Housing, education, and health care are among the areas he's focused on since taking office. He works for Vice President for Stuart Title. Seated next to him is uh, Dr. Cheryl Lynn Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts is a business and economics researcher at the Center for Community and Business Research here at UTSA. Uh, the organization publishes several reports, including the economic impact of oil and gas activities in the West Texas Energy Consortium. Uh, it looks at population, education, health care, and those impacts as a result of the boom. Welcome. Seated next to her is State Representative Mike Villarreal, native of San Antonio as well, a full-time financial analyst. He was first elected in 2000 to serve in the State House. He too is seeking re-election for his House District seat. In May, he will again be on the ballot, uh, looking to become the next mayor of the great city of San Antonio. Welcome. And finally, last but not least, is State, State Senator, pardon me, Judith Zaffarini, a native of Laredo, first elected in 1992. Today she's the second highest ranking senior or senator and highest ranking woman. In addition to her work on the higher education, education and health and human services committees, in 2012 she organized the Eagle Ford Shale Legislative Caucus. Welcome. Let's have a round of applause for these two. Well, I was one of the reporters who was able uh, to work on the Shale Life series that published this week, and hopefully you guys have gotten a chance to see that, but I also did additional research for this panel and looking at the Methodist Healthcare Ministries, pardon me, um, study, they had a quote in there that I thought was a good way to start it. As any gambler knows, even hitting the jackpot has its cost, and I think a lot of that, you know, can be seen in healthcare and education. A common issue with these, uh, with social issues, is just workforce, and, and obviously there's tons of jobs in the oil fields, but sustaining those key jobs that keep a community running is uh, number one. Starts with education. Yeah, I think the goal of a lot of these communities is to grow their own workforce because of housing issues and whatnot. And last session we saw the passage of HB5, which gave school districts the freedom to kind of tailor their uh, curriculum to meet those needs. Um, what are the keys as far as aligning the education and workforce? I know uh, the Petroleum Academy, both Midland ISD and United ISD have those in play. Senator Zaffarini, what with United um, is addressing that need? Well, United ISD in Laredo is working very closely with the industry and with A&M International University and most of all with Laredo Community College. And they are offering the oil and gas <coughs> curriculum that has been so popular and in fact was the model for Midland. And basically what they're doing is they're offering a pathway, a pathway through which students can start at the high school level and follow one of the pa endorsed pathways, work with the community college to ensure that if those students want to continue and go on to higher education, they can pursue a degree and get credit for some of those courses. At the very same time, they're ready for a job straight out of high school. What we're trying to ensure is that these students plan a career not simply prepare for a job because there's so much focus on the workforce and that is important and it's important that the high schools and the colleges align their programs with the industry but at the same time we want the students to think higher not simply to get a, a job but to perhaps be entrepreneurs to perhaps be creators of jobs i remember one time we were at a meeting in ensenal and the focus was on the workforce and everybody was talking about the welders and the truck drivers and all of the different people who were needed, all the positions that were available. And I said, well, we also need to train the entrepreneurs and the engineers. And somebody from San Antonio said, oh, don't worry about that. We have those in San Antonio. And of course, all of us from outside San Antonio said, we're glad that they are in San Antonio. And San Antonio certainly has that asset. But we want to grow our own, too, throughout the region. And that's our focus. And that is why at A&M International University, for example, we're starting a degree in petroleum engineer so that the students can be prepared to dream high and not simply to drop out of high school to get a high paying job and not simply to get a job after high school but to plan a career 
and to themselves think of being entrepreneurs and creators of jobs. Dr. Roberts, you have extensive work kind of growing entrepreneurs and, and have had many start their own businesses from your teachings. Uh, what are key or unique characteristics as far as entrepreneurs in these shale regions? One of the most important things to understand. Go yeah. ahead and, oops. Yep. <laughs> All right, I should be live now. Yes? Still not? There you go. There you go. No, no, you got there you go. <laughs> you got, you got it. it. All right, one of the key things to understanding what goes into entrepreneurship is to uh, allow innovation, to allow diversity, and to understand that it's not just one track. Um, you build competencies, you build things from the ground up in these localities, and one of the important things that education can do is offer students a track, a linkage. Uh, we have some really good programs that start at the high school level and allow students to do community projects, pioneered youth leadership in the Middle Rio Grande uh, Development Council is doing that across multiple school, school districts. They have curriculum there where the students can go in, can learn leadership skills, can learn entrepreneurship skills, can build a project for their community, have that project come to fruition, and then when they want to come to, let's say, UTSA for an education, they have something that they can go back to. They have connections with each other with other students in other communities and school districts, and they can start building that leadership base, which is very, very important. Those connections need to be made in the locality, not from the top down, not enforced from outside, and that's really, really important. Some of the things that uh, were mentioned as far as these new education tracks also are important. We tend to think of education as uh, a segment of going to high school, then going to college, and then going into the career. But these earn as you learn programs are very important. There are some new programs now through uh, several of the community college districts across South Texas where students can enter, be assessed, pick out a career track of interest, start earning while they are in the beginnings of these lessons. Sometimes within a month they can be placed in apprenticeships and those programs build on each other. If they find a career track and they get training, technical training or whatnot, they can start immediately and get workforce experience and those programs are lockstep, the three month, six month, one year certifications, two year degree programs and then that's transferable into a four year institution if they so choose. Well and what's key there in all of your uh, comments is that, you know, a great relationship with the business community. As I mentioned, yep. HB5 passed pretty unanimously uh, last session. A lot of people just wanting more options and districts, listening to their districts. Uh, Representative Menendez, what have you heard from the business community as far as uh, that goes? Well, it's been for some time now that it seems like the business community feels that the students coming out of the, the educational system aren't prepared for the jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's refreshing to hear both from the Senator and, and Professor Roberts uh, that there seems to be a focus on let's give people career tracks and let's get them an ability to earn some money while they're in school because for so many families, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's been a deterrent in the past and I, I couldn't agree more with the Senator that we don't want them to drop out just to earn some money because, like you mentioned, the jackpot, that, that in and of itself, that analogy is very accurate that we don't know how long. And some people say it's the biggest shale and it, and it could be many, many years, but we really don't know. And so what I'd hate for someone to happen is to just forego a long-term life, a, a, a great career path for a short-term gain. So, uh, but I, I think as, as I hear the professor and, and the senator, there's a possibility to do both. If you were to teach someone a trade like welding or, or driving, and also the ability to how to be, think of yourself as your own profit center, and then maybe what if you hired someone else to join you and you train them once you've had some experience and then you could become your own small business and not just be an individual you know, working for someone. You could go out on your own. And I, and I think that's one of the great things I've seen about the Eagle Ford. You see a lot of trucks with their own you know, trucking company, you know, whether it be uh, you know, Aguilar Trucking or whatever. It's just you notice it's not just big corporate names but also smaller entrepreneurial names. And so that's neat. That, that's, a, I think, a, a really good positive. Representative? 
Um, so House Bill 5 is this wonderful opportunity, and, and for those that maybe aren't closely following education policy at the state level, House Bill 5 is the bill that we passed in 2013 that allows students and educators uh, more flexibility at the local level to choose electives, to create pathways for high quality vocational technical education. Uh, it also changed the accountability system so that we evaluate high schools in their ability not just to send kids to four-year colleges, but also graduate students while we have them in high school with certifications that are in demand. And, and so it's, a, it's a, a really important step at the state level in allowing for creativity at the local level. But it really does come down to how well local communities implement <coughs> House Bill 5. How, do they take the most? Do, how do they make the most of this flexibility? Are they bringing together the biggest employers with education leaders to have a conversation about what are, what are the skills gaps present in their local area? We're doing that here in San Antonio. We've identified a number of sectors, uh, auto manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing, cybersecurity, uh, computer programming, healthcare uh, are a few. Of course, oil and gas is a sector that is the fastest growing in this area. But uh, these sectors are the ones that give us the most promise for diversification. And local employers, uh, starting with Charles Butt, HEB, have partnered with the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce to build out a system of summer jobs, internships, apprenticeships within these sectors that will allow students at the earliest ages to learn by doing, to, to, to really contextualize the fundamentals of math and science by working in a given area. And, and bring to life those subjects. And so I think we, we're trying to make the most of this uh, oil and gas boom by uh, supporting it, uh, but also leveraging the extra revenue and energy around it in building out uh, these pathways to other areas as well. We know the history of Texas uh, is one of ups and downs in our economy because oil and gas is so important. You know, we're very fortunate to have this natural resource. It's a blessing. Uh, but if we don't take advantage when we're riding up high and invest those extra dollars into other parts of our economy so that we have a diverse portfolio of job creation, then the downs are really down. And, and we will have missed out. And so that's what we're, that's, that's one thing that we're trying to do here in San Antonio. And I agree with the perspective expressed by my colleagues on the panel. I agree with everything they said truly, which is a nice surprise to be on the panel. <laughs> I'm used to being outnumbered by Republicans. <laughs> and so this is nice to be on the same page with my fellow panelists. But what I always want to be sure is that we look beyond the job, mm -hmm. that we focus on the quality of life and the holistic approach to education and that we insist that our educators, the representatives of the industry, we as legislators, that we look beyond the job to ensure that we help prepare all of these young people, people of all ages, for a better future. That they take time out to recognize what else they need to learn besides the skills needed to hold a job. And my concern is that sometimes a blessing can also bring a peril. For example, the entry level jobs of $50,000, $75,000 are so tempting an average salary of more than $100,000. That can be so tempting, but what if the shale ends in 10, 15, or 20 years? What will that truck driver do if all he or she did was drive a truck for 20 years? Now, I'm glad they had a good paying job. We have to ensure that that truck driver is also enjoying a high quality of life and has enough recreational opportunities, enough opportunities to enjoy the arts, to enjoy social interactions, et cetera, not simply focus on the job. Well, speaking of careers, you know, talking about education, of course you need good teachers to be able to facilitate these goals, especially in the rural areas of your district. How do you attract teachers, especially when, you know, they can make so much more in the oil fields? Well, that's a real problem. 
It's a real challenge, not only at the high school and elementary school level, but especially at the early childhood level and higher education level. And to be perfectly frank, those of us who live in the counties that are not only in the shale, but also along the border, also have the problem with the cartels across the river. Mm -hmm. And there are many people who don't differentiate, for example, between Laredo and Texas versus Nuevo Laredo in Mexico. So sometimes the universities or the college will try to recruit a professor, the schools, the ISD will try to recruit a teacher and they say, oh no, we're afraid to go there, it's dangerous. So we have that in addition to the challenge of these high paying jobs. And what we have to ensure is the right kind of people are attracted who are dedicated to educating others. People who choose to teach are really those who want to improve the quality of life of families, not simply of the student, but of the entire family. And those people are out there. Now, how do we attract them? Well, for one thing, we have to ensure that they're paid well too. We can't pay them dramatically less than an entry level person who goes to work in the oil and gas industry. And that's the legislature's responsibility, partly. We who are legislators have to work together with our ISDs, with all of our university and higher education personnel to ensure that we have attractive jobs that offer security and that reward people who, are, who excel in their professions and who are committed to educating students of all ages, but that they are paid well. Can the ISDs not capitalize on the increased tax revenue in their districts? They, they can, uh, but uh, there are other costs associated. Um, I, the, the salary uh, issue is, is tremendous. I mean, the, the average salary in the sector is 90, $4,000. I mean, think about that. $94,000. That was probably last year, <clears throat> and it's going up. And, and so you're seeing a, a shift from every other sector to this one in these areas. And, and so it's having these, these challenges uh, that, that, you know, I, I think there, there's, these two dynamics that we have to be really cognizant of is one is this one I speak of where we, we can't um, deplete all the other support sectors in healthcare, having EMS workers, uh, teachers, you know, uh, all other labor positions in a community that allow for a community to be healthy and, and be a place where families wanna live. So we have to mitigate the drain of those workers outside of those other job sectors while also looking towards the future and taking the investment, the growth in revenue in our public coffers and investing them strategically in areas of our sector that also support oil and gas, but, but diversify our larger economy. I think that's kind of the twin challenge um, that the Shell has brought us. Is there a role for the state legislature to play as far as encouraging communities who have been through the boom before and know that it can go away, who are hesitant to invest, knowing that they won't have it forever? I, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've done it in the past, and, and, and Senator Vanifee has been a leader on, on graduate medical education, on, on the incentives to medical uh, health professionals to come to, to underserved areas. Um, I think we should look at something similar for our educators. Uh, you talk to a lot of, you talk to uh, superintendents here in San Antonio, and they're losing bus drivers to the shale. Here in San Antonio, people who are commercial driver's license will leave. Uh, talked to a gentleman yesterday, he was in Midland. He was driving through Midland, there was a Domino's uh, pizza he drove by, and it said uh, drivers wanted $25 an hour for a, for a pizza delivery. Mm -hmm. So. The challenges are, are great, and, and, but you know what? We've faced these in the past. I was reading an article last week. Uh, the steel mills would have a history of, of people graduating from high school and their parent, their father worked in the steel mill and they would end up in the steel mill. And, the, and some of these young students would tell the teacher, well, next year I'm gonna be making more money than you. In a few months when I graduate, I'll be making. And so I'm sure there are people in high school near the, you know, in the shell thinking, I'm gonna go into that $94,000. I'm gonna, 50,000, 70,000, hey, that's, let's go. Uh, I know that would have been difficult for me to pass up thinking about, but, but we have got to figure out uh, 
how do we make, as a state, I think Mike's, Mike's right on target, how do we take the increase in revenue to the state and think of ways to, uh, to, to invest it? I mean, we gotta think about this. Is this, is a, this is a boon for the state of Texas and how can we help uh, reinvest? Because you, know, you were saying, can they benefit from the increased revenue? Well, we do have recapture. Mm-hmm. And so not, not just because they have increased wealth doesn't mean that it all stays there. Right. And so, uh, but, but as a state, we have to figure out ways to help them. Uh, just like we're looking at ways to improve the road system because of, of the damage that's being caused by the trucks. And so we just need to be smart as a state and, and think of reinvestment and not think of the fact that, you know, the worst thing we could do, I'd say, is, is, is take all of this money that comes in uh, from the oil and gas production and just say that we should uh, cut more when our needs are growing. And I see that's one of the concerns that I have, mm-hmm. is that with the newly elected, we've heard so many of them talking about how we still need to cut more, but we haven't even restored the cuts that have been made. Yeah. And so that's a huge concern. You know, I, I don't think I answered the, your question. So a lot of these school districts are becoming property wealthy, and so they'll have more local revenue, but as their local revenue grows, their state share shrinks. And ultimately, there's a cap on how much money they can raise per student, even it, with recapture, mm-hmm. uh, the Robin Hood program. And, and so that's a challenge, given that they are having trouble recruiting teachers and, or, or even uh, educating the students. They, they have a unique problem with highly mobile students. Families will come in for the work, bring their children, a, a given school, Doby ISD, <clears throat> received a special needs student. They hired, who, who need a, needed special care and instruction, they hired a special ed teacher for $60,000 a year. Five months into the year, the student left, but they were stuck with that teacher. And so these are sort of unintended, unexpected dynamics mm-hmm. of our school finance system, which is based on an annual calendar to serve students who can come and go any day. I'd like to touch a little bit on the innovation aspect of education. A lot of times when we think of education, we think of the teacher and the student and any infrastructure that they work in. If we look at education as a resource, we can see that in a lot of these communities, the school is a main center for the community. It is a community hub. That resource of education, the infrastructure, the educators that have a lot of knowledge and methodology there, whether it's at the K through 12 level, the community college level, the university level, is an educational resource for the community. It's not just the child and the teacher in the classroom. Texas uh, Education Agency has an incredible program called the Texas Virtual School Network, where school districts can take curriculum and it can be made available through those school districts to students anywhere across the state. So what you were talking about, for example, mobile students, you can enroll a student in this and they can still have access to the curriculum and the education. What we do here at UTSA uh, has a lot of research capacity on behalf of communities where communities come to us and they have a question. Use your educators. Instead of thinking of the school as this cost where you've got to pay for the teachers so you can get X amount of students out of the system. Think of it as a resource, expand those services, and that might help us with some of our finance, how we, how we do creative financing for this resource. When you go to job fairs, I went to a Midland job fair, it was about 30 or 40 different uh, petroleum related companies, and their big qualms were, you know, they were either the workers or the people coming there weren't experienced, or they didn't have the housing or schools to be able to attract a small family or whatnot to the region. What do you hear in the rural areas as far as, I mean, is the, the business community willing to help invest to make sure that there are schools they can attract families with those workers? Well, the business community has been very cooperative and certainly the oil and gas industry has been wonderful. But I like to say that today's producer is not your great grandfather's producer. <laughs> They're more aware of their social responsibilities. They're keenly aware of the environment and they really are involved in improving the schools, working with our schools, and supporting our teachers in many ways, recognizing them, for example, sponsoring programs, sponsoring scholarships. 
So they have been absolutely wonderful in so many ways, and I'm very impressed with them. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. L locally, uh, Chesapeake has uh, helped raise money to contribute to our United Way and in, in meeting needs of families throughout this community. I know in rural areas, they've helped build the capacity of EMS services and first responders. And, and so I have to concur. We, we, we are seeing um, a sector that it sees its larger role, not just in generating profit and uh, realizing energy independence, but, but also giving back. And, and that's important to recognize. One of the things that would be helpful if the oil and gas industry could help other people, potential investors, through that want to build housing, but their concern is how, how long? If we, if we get into a 15, 20, 30 year mortgage to build a multifamily unit housing development or a community neighborhood, will the place still be here? And so those are some of the things that I think the oil and gas uh, industry could do or become investors. And I know that they have, in some cases, become investors um, to help you know, uh, bring the rents to a realistic level. I mean, the, the, you hear of these man camps and you hear of these, these uh, single you know, studios going for eight, $900 rents that are crazy. And then what, what I find interesting is that uh, to see at, at my HEB over at you know, 1604 in Petranco, the guys on the weekends in their, uh, in their drill uh, uniforms, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, their families are living here and they're going back and forth or they're living down there during the week. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see uh, the, the, the sacrifices or the, the things that they're finding ways to make, make do, but, but you, have to, you have to work together. And so I agree also uh, with the panelists that the, production, the oil and gas production industry has been helpful, but I think they don't realize sometimes that the rest of the community is kind of looking and wondering, you know, how much longer, what's the longevity so that they can make investments for the long term. I think one of the important things, too, to, to understand in some of these communities is it takes a long time to plan. Um, understanding uh, how to even build the infrastructure, communities that don't even have the, the pipes for the water to go through, or, uh, you know, even laying out roads and that type of thing. Uh, there are a lot of research areas that we have addressed where uh, communities have come to us and said, we just really don't know what to do. Um, some of, one of the things that we've said is think of your community as a good place to live. What types of quality of life things would you want to plan for? Um, all of those things go into it. Where are your kids going to go after school? Where are you going to go shopping? All those questions um, can't be answered with the flip of a switch or overnight. And sometimes there's some long range planning uh, on the budget side as well as on the infrastructure side and and those are all very serious issues that we can uh, address. But that social infrastructure is so important. So suppose you have oil field workers who work eight hours or perhaps even overtime in Encinal, Texas. Then what do they do after work? Where do they go? Do they drive to Laredo, 39 miles away? If so, that's more traffic on the highways. And one of the biggest problems that we have is not enough to do after hours. So that's why I say we have to focus on the quality of life and the social infrastructure. A related problem as we deal with the educational aspect of it is that many of these employers are inex employees are inexperienced. Mm -hmm. They're driving trucks for the first time. They're welding for the first time. And they're young and inexperienced or they're older and starting a new job. And so for that reason, we have to make sure that they are educated to their best capacity and their education continues. One of the things that we've talked about that we haven't succeeded in and realizing yet is perhaps offering classes on site after hours. So that perhaps mm -hmm. in a place like Encinal, Texas, instead of workers thinking in terms of completing their GED there on, on site or going to Laredo Community College, driving over there and having all those people either carpool or drive individually to Laredo, bring an instructor to the site. Mm -hmm. and perhaps start a pilot project and have some on-site educational programs, <coughs> including GED for those who don't have their high school diploma, and certainly for, career, for college courses, mm -hmm. especially if they can lead to a degree, so that they can have these high-paying jobs and still pursue a degree. And, and just to piggyback on what you just said, you know, so then we could take your model that you've des described, and so many corporations will say to their employees, if you make a B average, we'll pay for 80% of your... Be on time. There you go. So <laughs> now, we tell, what if the, the, oil, the oil producers say, you know what, 
it's in our best interest for them to be here studying rather than being on the road or out late. Uh, you know, well, if you go to class and you have a B average, we'll, we'll pay for it. So uh, maybe we can solve some problems. Let's here. work on that, Bill. I like it. I like it. Well, it's all interconnected. You talk about you know inexperienced workers that can lead to an increase in uh, work-related accidents and illness and and whatnot, and that puts a strain on the healthcare workers. I'm talking to first responders again in Midland because that's where I went for this uh, shale project that we just completed. A lot of the guys there, most are from out of state, some out of the country because they can't again attract the locals. Uh, a lot of them are living together because of the housing prices and whatnot. What is the key there as far as another basic service as far as addressing health care needs, increased demand on those people, and again the, the wage is just not there? Well if the problems are interrelated, the solutions are interrelated. And that's why we have to collaborate. All of the stakeholders have to come to the table and realize that as we are celebrating the benefits of the Eagle Ford Shale, that we also address all of the challenges. And there isn't an aspect of community living that isn't impacted, whether it's health care or public safety. They're all interrelated, the environment. So we all have to come to the table and work together to not only celebrate the blessings, but especially to address the problem. Step number one is to identify the problem. For example, public safety. We know that as more people come to this area, we have more vehicles on the roads. The highways and the roads are suffering. In fact, last year we dealt with that horrific recommendation and action of the Texas Transportation Department of graveling paved roads. As we said in Laredo, por favor. I mean, Dolph Briscoe was rolling over in his grave to see his farm to market roads graveled. Now, thank God that the one road that was graveled in Live Oak County has now been repaved. But you see, you can't identify one problem and solve it independently of all the others. They're all <coughs> interrelated. More people move into the area, they need more programs, they need more services, they need more roads, they bring more vehicles, they don't bring their education and their water and everything with them, everything that they need. So they're all interrelated and we have to collaborate. Representative. We, we designed more than a decade ago a system of capturing the growth in revenue that was mainly driven by uh, oil and gas booms and putting it into a savings account for rainy days. Uh, it's called the Economic Stabilization Fund, often referred to as the Rainy Day Fund. The comptroller today estimates that that fund, when we arrive in January, will have about eight and a half billion dollars in it. The comptroller historically has undervalued <laughs> how much money we ac will actually have. And so I, I, I think there are critics who say it's closer to $10 billion or 11. or 11 billion. It's a large number. We have gotten away from using this extra money to stabilize our larger economy and invest broadly. We're about to vote on a constitutional amendment, which is needed, but it's, it's, it's an example of very narrow thinking and siloed thinking, where 1.7 billion will be taken away from the flow into the rainy day fund and invested in transportation infrastructure, which we all agree is needed, and, that, and that's an important investment in infrastructure that should take place. But that's not the only investment in infrastructure that should take place. Healthcare, higher ed, education, all these areas are being impacted in and around the Eagleford Shell. Certainly let's strengthen our transportation system, but let's not be blind to these other needs. Last legislative session, there was a movement to uh, see who is the most conservative by not touching the rainy day fund for those anything. Are my former panelists. Those were your former, <laughs> yeah, the, those are the, the other folks you were talking about earlier. Um, and, and it shouldn't be about, you know, political ideology. It should be about, well, what are the human problems? that are being experienced? And how can we best advance the public interest? Today, 
for those of us living through this period, but also for our kids and grandkids and future generations. Well, you mentioned the election on Tuesday, and polls and numbers indicate that it looks like it's, you're still going to have Republican control, if you will, or pro Republican leadership, I should say. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, you can maybe go into the next session expecting that maybe won't change as far as willingness to spend on the rainy day fund. So what other ways? I, I think we're going we're gonna to have, be we're going to be challenged to make the argument that this is a financially wise investment to make. Over the long term, this is the, in the best interest of Texas. If we want to continue to grow prosperity, we need to make smart, strategic investments in education and health care. Your question, I didn't finish, I didn't hear your question. You were saying, what are the ways? What are the ways outside of the rainy day fund can you help address the educational needs? Just, I mean, uh, the Republicans will say just throwing more money at the problem isn't necessarily the solution. The, the only reason, but. the only, okay, so w I believe one of the only reasons we've we never don't tried that, though. <laughs> we've right. never tried throwing I, and more and money uh, at the I problem, have we? <laughs> one of the way, reasons we don't have vouchers in Texas is because it's one of those few areas where taking Senator Van de Pute's holistic approach, Senator Van de Pute, Senator Zafferini, sorry. You compliment me, thank well, you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so taking Senator Zafferini's uh, holistic approach, where you, we have had rural Republicans working with the rest of us that believe that the, the voucher idea is not a good idea, that we need to continue to invest in our public school system. So I think the only way to get to where, where Mike is talking about sort of trying to convince them that this is a good investment and, and is, is really to try to give them a history lesson. But the problem is that, that we're, the, the people that are sometimes being elected aren't interested in hearing common sense and logic. And so that's one of the issues that we're, that we're having to deal with. Because I think, uh, and, and speaking to former Senator Armbruster, he said it was never meant to be this, this, this you know, lockbox that you couldn't touch. It was meant as an investment account, a savings account for the state. And so here we have a, a, a logical time. And Mike, one of the things that you've been always a huge advocate, I, both of you have, uh, and that I've come to, to see the, the importance of would be uh, pre-K, you know, the, the, the health, education, but at the youngest stages of the game, at the earliest stages, early, early childhood education. If we could get early childhood education throughout the state, I think then you could see an increase in children who even though the money was good in high school, they already had a, a longer term career outlook, a pathway, an outlook to a long term education, to a, to a higher education because of their love for education. And that gets created, Mike, as you know, and, and Senator, as you know, and, and I'm sure Professor, as you know, at a very young age. You will see it, I, I've, I've started to see it uh, with, with the children, and the, the earlier you create that, that love for education. So uh, the investments that this state needs to make should start at the very early age. But you know what won't happen without the cooperation of the business community? And see, sometimes what's interesting is that the politicians, when they're running, they're all you know, running to the, you know, the business community to ask for their support. But then they get elected and they forget about what they, you know, who they were talking to. They forget about talking to the constituencies and the, because there's such vocal, you know, seemingly vocal, small, outlying you know, segments controlling them, it appears. Well, I want to emphasize that when we established the Rainy Day Fund, our dream was to have $2 billion in it. That was our dream. And it really was intended for when we had a problem, when the state faced a shortfall of some nature. We've been there. And in fact, lots of people like to say at certain times, like in 2005 and in 2011, they said, this isn't a rainy day, it's a storm. And yet there are those who are reluctant to touch the Rainy Day Fund. It is a resource, it is something that we should use for the state's priorities. I feel very strongly about that, but unfortunately, the majority of the members of the legislature do not. But that is an important source for us and one that I believe that we should tap for our priorities. Mm -hmm. Professor, excuse me real quick. Just let me uh, let you guys know we have about five minutes left of discussion, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to line up at, um, I guess, just the mic here. Um, and that's it, so go ahead. Uh, I think it's, it's an important economic uh, message. Sometimes when we think about budgeting, we think of it as we're going to spend this money on chocolate cake. That's not how the economy works. 
economies grow, they intermingle, they form ecologies of behaviors and activities. And when that money is spent on something, it just doesn't go into a hole. It goes somewhere, and it's used again. We, te we tend to think of dollars instead of capital, instead of the value. And I think it's really important to understand that some of these funds are investments, and those funds go on and they have a life after that initial outlay uh, is considered. And, and I think that is often missing in the discussions about the budget. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to take a, a lesson from our success in passing House Bill 5. It, it was the first piece of legislation that rolled back the emphasis on standardized testing. We cut the number of standardized exams from 15 to 5 at the high school level. Mm -hmm. And we did it because we built a coalition of interests, not just educators, uh, not just parents, but also members of industry oil and gas was there in the public ed committee, along with other sectors, um, wanting us to make changes to accommodate high quality vocational education, and, and that was important. And so I, I think for next legislative session, we need to build a similar coalition mm -hmm. that has an agenda that's very strategic, targeted, not just let's grow the budget, but let's make specific investments here and here and here in education and healthcare concerns. Healthcare is huge. I mean, just the, the different challenges that come as far as the geographical distances that some of these workers, for instance, from the fields have to travel just to get basic care. Can we expect maybe something this legislative session, you think, uh, equal of HB5 for the healthcare to attract more providers to come to these areas and set up shop? Hmm. I. I've always been an optimist, but um, recently what I've seen and heard in the campaign trails, it doesn't give me a, a, a huge level of, of that sense. But, but I think it doesn't, it doesn't mean we give up. And one of the things I've admired for years of uh, uh, Senator Zaffarini is that she doesn't care who she's fighting, she'll fight till the end. And so, right. and so, uh, and so you know, we, 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 we're gonna have to, uh, we're just going to have to do what, what we've all been saying in different ways, is, is make the best cases for that. Now, I think that the word capital was put out there a few minutes ago, and, and Professor Roberts mentioned that in ter terms of not just cash outlay, but the investment for the long run. If we talk to, let's say, the healthcare industry, we talk to the hospitals, and they're hurting, but you now see them all building these little dock in a box, you know, emergency, urgent cares. Well, what if you know there was a plan that if you had some of these along some of the major intersections along 35 uh, and different routes, so that you could have a, a, an emergency room that could stabilize patients out in the community? And so, if the state could figure out a way that we could sort of incentivize healthcare professionals working with the healthcare industry, maybe we could make a, a common sense enough issue that everybody could understand. The single most important thing we could do in healthcare is Medicaid expansion. Oh yeah. We would see a hundred billion dollars in health care over for Texas over the next decade. It would allow us to increase our reimbursement rates to doctors, incentivizing to take these patients. We have the largest share of any state population that's uninsured. Mm -hmm. That's what should happen. But there are ways to bring more healthcare professionals to the region. And one of the ways is to look at the new medical school in Austin, Central Texas, and some of the persons who pursue medical degrees there might be interested in pursuing some of their studies in the Eagle Ford Shale, specifically in the underserved areas. In fact, outside of Bear County in the Shale, we have 12 hospitals in the other 17 counties. 12 hospitals. The rest are all in Bear County. It's unbelievable <coughs> what a medically underserved area this is. But we're also getting a new medical school in the valley. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the leaders from that medical school are already collaborating with other universities and community colleges in the region. And together they can develop a program that will focus on graduate medical education. We need more positions for resident students especially. We don't have enough. So what happens in Texas is that we train our doctors and then they go out of state. Mm -hmm. 
for their residencies. We have to ensure that we have more positions. My personal goal is to have a residency position for every qualified Texan in every Texas medical school plus 10 percent. 10 percent from other states or from other countries come wherever they may be. But those people who come here for residencies are likely to stay here. By the same token, Texas students who go out of state for their residencies are likely to stay there. Mm -hmm. That's where they'll fall in love and have yep. children and live forever. So that's the focus. I think that these two new medical schools will really be of incredible importance for attracting healthcare professionals. If there are doctors, there are nurses, there are nurse practitioners and other healthcare professionals too. So I'm optimistic about it, cautiously optimistic. Thank you. Um, well, that does it for our discussion. Can let's have a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Well, I have to say I'm used to being outnumbered two to one or three to one Republican to Democrat, but I apologize to the professor. Today you were at number three to one. <laughs> <laughs> Legislator to professor. Do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody who wants to step up to the mic? For the sake of time, we'd ask for quick questions if you don't mind. Right, so thank you very much. Uh, there are many questions I have, but obviously can only ask one. But I'd like to focus on this uh, discussion of health care provisions for the future. We heard a lot of discussions about infrastructure for roads. For, we heard about education and so forth. I think this goes back to how we see the human person in our society. Are we going to approach the human being in their education and providing for their health care or their jobs only as uh, an object that can produce, help us make money, uh, and incentivize them with money, are we going to look at them as a human being with dignity and treat them as such? And so we see a lot of workers being exposed to dangerous situations, uh, toxic chemicals, uh, the sand that they work with, uh, not wearing protective gear in many cases, truck drivers who are really uh, running down their health because of their work schedules and so forth. Uh, how are we going to provide for the health care of the future and a lot of these people are going to have COPDs, are going to have long-term illnesses, and may not be able to afford their care. Now, I realize this is kind of moving into the dark side of all the good news we heard this morning. But I think to be realistic in providing for the future, we have to take these things into consideration. So are the studies being done, uh, the sociological studies, the health studies? Uh, are we thinking in terms of providing that infrastructure for them for the future? Thank you. Professor? Um, I'll say just a little bit about this. Uh, one of the things that always happens when you've got a new technology and it comes in, there's a learning curve. And one of the interesting things has been that in some of these outlying areas where it would take a long period of time for a worker who was injured to make it to a healthcare facility, some of these corporations have started putting on-site ambulances, on-site healthcare, and uh, I, I really think that that's a good trend. Uh, put the health care where some of these work accidents are happening. So I applaud those companies that are, that are pursuing that type of thing. We also have several innovations uh, that could be implemented throughout the region, telemedicine, for example, and other types of virtual uh, medical care. And I think that this is, these are great questions. Um, we should do some more research on this. And some of the, the tests and some of the treatments that may be developed because we have new medical schools in the area and they no doubt are going to start concentrating on this type of thing is really something that we need to be looking at. Well, and I think and the position that she projected is really consistent with what we agreed upon and that right. is the quality of life right. and a brighter future for the person and not that we simply focus on a person and the job that that person is going to get and perform and hold. So I think that her, her question really reflects our position as a panel. Well, yeah, and I think I heard so also, what about the long-term implications? And I think uh, the best thing we can do is, is improve our healthcare system overall. And I think, you know, you've heard from everybody on the panel, there's no doubt that if we, uh, as a state, agreed to bring back our own tax dollars, those, those uh, nine to 10 billion dollars a year uh, that we're currently sending off to other states, I mean, we would be able to invest. And kudos to many of those uh, companies that are drilling are now have made it taken upon themselves to disclose what they, the chemicals and what they're using in the fracking. And so it'd be easier for them to know. And so that's something that they agreed to last session. Yes, in some of the studies, and no one's mentioned it here, there were some studies about the man camps and 
the high rate of sexually transmitted infections that are coming out of these. Are there any steps, and I know y'all probably don't have the answers to this because y'all aren't in the industry, any steps in those areas to increase the amount of interventions that are done with the guys in the camps in order to either, one, stop sex trafficking that's coming into those camps and provide the uh, needed barrier coverings or whatever, condoms or whatever that they need or education individuals need in order not to transmit this. Because these in the man camps, like y'all said, the guys, you're seeing them up off of 1604 in their drilling rigs. Well, they're going out there working during the week yep. and coming back to the community during, on the weekends, or I, I come from the 80s when the boom hit in Central Texas and they would go work seven days on, seven days off. So they go out, have their good times while they're at the man camp and then come home and bring sexually transmitted infections back to the community. Professor, so I that's my question about, you know, what's when it comes to medical care, I think it's great that they're putting uh, occupational uh, medicine on the on the sites, but what's happening to educate them on how to not transmit other diseases. Right. There are two there. issues here. One is getting information. And obviously, uh, you know, that's that's always a need. Where are you going to get your information? How are you going to measure the information? And there's an ongoing need for more studies and more research. But on the other hand, we know that uh, the healthcare um, industry has said that preventative medicine is one of those new frontiers. And in trying to beef up our healthcare system, we want to look not only at treatments, but at prevention. Letting people know what their lifestyle choices may lead to, uh, what do they do if they see certain types of symptoms and that type of thing. Well, prevention is treatment. So if you can prevent it from ever happening, it is treatment. And it's only going to take one individual coming down with, I'm not going to say Ebola, but coming down with HIV to spread it into another community. So, I mean, we have to think about that. And if they're not offering the education to the guys or the individuals that are working on the scene, then that's not, and giving them the resources in order to protect themselves, then that's only taking it back to the communities in which they come from. Because not everybody's moving to those communities. They can't afford the housing, so the guys go and stay and share bunks and then go home to their families over the, uh, during the week. Thank you for your question. With that, uh, our time is up, and let's have another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.